Hello and welcome to another Fuds on Film podcast. I am Drew Tavendale, with me Scott Morris. Oh. Sadly Craig can't join us this evening, but we hope we can make up for his absence. Now, when we began Fuds on Film, one of our aims was to explore and open ourselves up to areas of film with which we were less familiar, and to broaden our, and hopefully by extension our listeners' cinematic horizons. To that end, this will be the first of two podcasts in which we look at La Nouvelle Vague, known to English speakers as the French New Wave, with this podcast covering the work of the directors of the Cahiers du Cinéma group. The second podcast, which will replace our usual intermission episode this month, will cover the work of the directors of the Left Bank group. Just a, a brief pressé of what the Nouvelle Vague was all about for those who are unfamiliar with it. The Nouvelle Vague was a term created by critics to cover a movement, or because it was quite loose, perhaps a trend would be a more appropriate word, amongst filmmakers in France in the late 1950s and 1960s. The general idea of the new wave was to experiment with the cinematic norm to try new, or at least less common, narrative structures and editing techniques and styles, greater use of location shooting, a differing visual style than was common in France and wider European cinema at the time. And there was also an emphasis on covering social issues prevalent in the country at the time. And technically, there was the use of a raw shooting style with the use of less equipment. Yeah, so I I think a large part of what we're talking about here is auteurism, which is not a concept they invented. Um, It was not unheard of in the studio systems before then, but it was tended to be reserved for like prodigal talents such as Orson Welles or, or Hitchcock. Yes, or a, a well-known one. Or of course those who are rich enough to simply buy their own studio. Hello Howard. <laughs> uh, so so yeah, I, I think it's important to point out Wave that, the future. It's important to point out we're not that we're actually experts in anything that we talk about, but that we know enough about most of the other stuff we've covered so far to say that we've got a pretty good foundation in having our opinions. And this new wave stuff is completely new to me. Continental Europe, European cinema in general is a bit of a weak spot for me. Um, I, I see some of the, the newer stuff that comes through that gets the, the reputation behind it and makes its way over here, but I've never really done any kind of deep dives on the oh, pre-2000 pre, era kind of stuff. Yes. I think, I mean, largely with you there, that I don't know European cinema anything like as well as I ought to. There yeah. have been well, the, the occasional European films, I know, um, from various different times. Some Bernardo Bertolucci stuff, Cinema Parody, so, which is an all-time favourite of mine. You know, things like The Bicycle Thieves. And I've, in fact, owned a few French New Wave DVDs for probably a decade now and never actually gotten around <laughs> to watching them. So it's been yeah. useful from that point of view, this podcast at least. Yeah, and nothing against them. It's just they've not had enough hours in the day to get around to watching everything and I've been more focused on outlandish to far east uh, <laughs> escapades. But so yeah. it was good to get into this. So this is very much a, a beginner's guide to uh, the French New Wave. The initial film list, what I did come up with for this was cribbed pretty much directly from the good guys at newwavefilm.com which has a French New Wave where to start so much thanks to them for uh, giving us the inspiration for these things that we've covered or well, perhaps not given some of what we'll talk about later on <laughs> <laughs> yes. the word blame may come up later <laughs> just to give you a wee bit of a spoiler there but yes I've been the same again I think my focus has been more on Asian cinema as well Scott with perhaps a bit focus on Latin American cinema too hmm. and have given not even intentionally, but given some sort of a cold shoulder to cinematic landscape much closer to home. So it's something that has opened my eyes for us, been a bit overdue. And well, there's something in here that uh, would encourage our listeners to check something else out as well. Um, are you ready to begin? Let's crack on. To wit then, our first film is, and I apologise in advance for my terrible friend's pronunciation, but I'm determined to give it a go at least. <laughs> it is Francois Truffaut's Le Cat Sans Coup, or The 400 Blows, as it's known in English. And my compatriot over there is going to tell us a little bit about it because I cared enough to watch these films, but not apparently <laughs> cared enough about um, you or him to prepare properly. So my apologies. <laughs> yes, so The 400 Blows, we are introduced to 
Antoine Donnell, played by Jean-Pierre Lenaud, a Parisian adolescent who can't seem to keep himself out of trouble at school, which spirals into delinquency fairly quickly. Uh, when we see his sub-modest home life, it's easy to feel empathy for the kid. While his stepfather does the best he can for Antoine, his mother treats him as little more than an obstacle to her life, and she's more interested in her bit on the side than any of the family. While it's unfair to say they're completely detached from Antoine, it's clear he's not the centre of their lives, as it was apparently common at the time, and Antoine grows more estranged from them. He develops uh, from truancy to petty theft, eventually winding up taken away to a young offenders institute for observation, which sounds more sinister than it actually is. <laughs> um, now... There's, I feel, a lot to like in 400 Blows. Uh, most obviously for me, it absolutely oozes charm, whether that's the compelling and natural performances from the leads or the locations of the film. Not exactly Paris's grimy underbelly, but it's not the glamorous postcard version either. It's all quite believable. It's shot in a way as to largely look contemporary today. No small feat for a film approaching 60 years old. That said, enjoyable as it is, there's a few reasons that I, my socks were not blown off. It's often claimed as being somewhat semi-autobiographical for Travaux. Um, it seems that many of the era could identify with Antoine's coming-of-age story, uh, as he seems to be left to traverse life's travails by himself. But whether it's the changing times or just fortunate family circumstances, I didn't have to deal with such an existential upbringing. Uh, I can emphasise, sure, but truly relating and connecting with Antoine's a little outside of my grasp. More gratingly for me, at least, is the inescapable feeling that this film doesn't have a point, which unfortunately for me is the point of the film. There's no forced redemption or any other narrative tricks to tie a neat little bow in Antoine's life at the end, and indeed the ending of the film is the exact opposite. It's a visual of him running from the past to an open future that we can only imagine, and I appreciate the difference in storytelling compared to the, the kind of more standard techniques you would have, but it turns out that a lot of the times the reason storytelling techniques have remained roughly constant since humans started telling stories is, <laughs> is that they satisfy on some deeper level than some mere intellect. And so while that part of my brain can applaud the intent of the narrative here, the other parts are protesting that they've been shortchanged. After all, pointless is rarely used as a compliment. I'm rather over-emphasising the negatives here though. Uh, for all my protestations, this is an amazingly charming little film. It uh, has one of the most believable portrayals of youth and family life, entirely uh, devoid of overblown histrionics or attempts to manipulate the audience emotionally. And as a debut film, certainly a debut feature, certainly it's one of the best. Certainly well worth your time and more thought-provoking than I would estimate 98.2% of all modern cinema. <laughs> what more do you want? Yes, this one I, I did thoroughly enjoy. This was one of the films I mentioned earlier that I have owned for quite a while. Mm. I bought the Criterion Collection disc a distressingly long time ago, quite frankly. <laughs> Having finally watched it, I'm kind of kicking myself, thinking I should have watched this before so I could have watched it again since. Largely good with you, Scott. The performance by Jean-Pierre Leo as Antoine is, is fantastic. It's very naturalistic. Mm. And he is, I suppose the word really would be likeable, even though he's, yeah, he's a delinquent. He's on the point of becoming a recidivist, really, yeah. that you imagine he might never get out of this lifestyle. But you can sympathise and empathise with him a little that he's sort of left to bring himself up in the middle of a city with all these temptations around without much parental support, certainly not from his mother. It's a very naturalistic performance. All of the children in it, actually. Yeah. Even if the adults feel, in some cases, a little ridiculous, but it's it's a pleasure to watch. They're entertaining. Yeah, the teacher's a bit of a cartoon character, isn't he? That's... He is a little, <laughs> yes. Um, but the... I mean, the mother character is pretty interesting. She yeah. begins to take more interest in him, but it's simply it's selfishness. She doesn't want her affair being found out by Antoine, or rather by her, her husband, uh, being told by Antoine. Mm. And it's just genuinely an enjoyable ride just to see what's happened to this boy. Now, I do take your point about the lack of narrative satisfaction in it, and that you know that that's actually something that normally bothers me a great deal. Mm. that I am very narratively driven. I, I like a satisfying story. In this case, I didn't actually mind that at all. I think I enjoyed the ride so much, I didn't mind that it wasn't much of a destination yeah. that way. Yeah, it, it certainly bothered me a lot less than it would do in a, a film that didn't have such a reservoir of kind of goodwill from the charm from it. Um, mm -hmm. Still, it, it did kind of nag away at me a little bit. So This it didn't bother me. It's like, I, I know it didn't really have that much of a point, although it, narrative ambiguity is a fairly big part of the French New Wave. Yeah. Now, that's not to say that that's okay. I mean, um, because in other films we're going to cover, 
it bothered me a great deal. Mm. But in this, because I just found it an interesting character piece, even without anything particularly strong to say about the character, just that I found the character likeable and the experiences he faced were interesting. I just found it interesting from that point of view. What do another interesting point to use the word interesting for now the fourth time in a bit <laughs> one sentence is that you looked at the end quite differently from me. And strange because I think I, I enjoyed it more than you. I certainly was not as dissatisfied with the ending. But at the same time, you saw him running towards the ocean at the end as him finding like broad new horizons. Whereas I saw him running towards the ocean, seeing that as a barrier. The kind of the opposite interpretation of you. I thought that it suggested that he was bounded and couldn't escape his past by running away from it towards this new horizon that there was nothing there. No, I always thought that was more of a callback to this. There's this mention earlier of trying to get to the beach and seeing the sea and all that kind of stuff. So it seemed to be more of a callback to that than it did sort of limiting his, his options for the future. But yeah, I know he said, yeah, he, he wanted to go there, but the, no, for me, that was more, he got there, he got where he wanted to go and realised that there was nowhere to go. That to me, I saw that as a boundary that, Plenty of places to go to the beach. You can go for ice cream and get a wee beach hut. <laughs> there are donkeys to ride. Yeah, tons of stuff. Ah, so I've just been too negative thinking that that's a boundary. Yeah. My interpretation of it being different from yours is because I'm so negative. <laughs> I don't consider the beach to have enough donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I and mean, for a debut feature too, it's incredibly accomplished. Yeah. I think narratively it's a little more conventional it's a little more narratively conventional in terms of editing also than some of the other films we might cover mm-hmm. but there is a, a, a certain a definite freshness to it yeah yeah think, definitely having seen some other films maybe from the 1950s I mean more British and American specifically but there's a definite freshness to the 400 blows that means it just sort of bombs along quite nicely and it feels it doesn't feel 60 years old I'll tell you that Oh no, I mean, as I say, it does feel almost contemporary. Uh, mm-hmm. There's not really much you would change here to have it released in a uh, kind of modern daytime and without, you know, to similar effect. Uh, yeah, I was quite yeah. impressed by, by that. It does feel very yeah, fresh. Yeah, it's not, it's really, yeah, it's not um, sort of bounded by its time at all because there's there's a child with parents who are working a lot who don't look after them very well and the child goes to school and there's a city with temptations and stuff and it's... Yeah, there's nothing there that is of its time that couldn't be updated at all. Yeah, and the, the techniques you kind of mentioned earlier with them going out and shooting in the streets, all these kind of things, does make it feel kind of more like a modern production where it's you know, easier to do that stuff technologically. It wasn't at the time. That's why a lot of the stuff would have been done on a soundstage before. Um, this kind of cutting those cords and getting out uh, into the real world does give it a, a freshness, uh, which uh, wasn't that common at the time and it certainly helps with feel, making it feel contemporary. I think we both mentioned that the performances seem naturalistic of course almost I think everything we're going to talk about here is uh, improvised with the or at, least, or at least you know to some degree improvised with the exception of uh, the My Night at Mods which is quite tightly scripted but improvisation does play quite a big part in the most of these new wave films that we're talking about and that mm-hmm. helps I suppose with some of the naturalistic performances and, and again it just it just helps uh, lend credibility to the piece. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one final thing I'll say is <laughs> just I've remembered that you, you mentioned it that when Antoine is sent for observation it does sound remarkably Bentham-esque, doesn't it? It's very much a panopticon thing there. It sounds, it's so sinister sounding that he's sent for yeah. observation. <laughs> so after Le Quatre Son Coup, we move on to another film by Truffaut from three years later. This one, Jules et Jim, which I don't really think I need to translate for you. <laughs> and again, you're going to hear Scott's voice a lot at the start of these because <laughs> I couldn't be bothered to... <laughs> to, to prepare that's not strictly true I just honestly didn't know how to begin so <laughs> Scott can begin and I will discuss later <laughs> I have to confess at the start I don't really know quite what to make of Joe's and Jim it narratively at least it, it covers the great friendship of the titular pair in a pre-World War One Paris an extroverted Frenchman Jim played by Henry Serra um, and an introverted Austrian author Jules played by Oscar Werner uh, they share a love of the bohemian lifestyle the arts and eventually Catherine played by Jean Moreau at the outbreak of World War One, the two are put on opposite sides of the conflict, with Jules marrying Kathleen and moving away to Austria. Reconnecting after the war's end, Jules confesses to Jim that the free-spirited Kathleen has not settled into home life, despite having a young daughter. 
Catherine had been known to have affairs and even leave for months at a time, yet all Jules appears to want to be is to be in her rough vicinity. As part of what I suppose is a plan of sorts, Jules gives Jim permission to act on the previous attraction to Catherine from the days in Paris, with the three living in relative harmony, for a while at least before it spirals out of control with an eventual tragic end. There's certainly elements that I can appreciate in here, it's well acted. There's a fluidity to the film that's perhaps a common trait in the new wave films, with the handheld camera work and the cuts that are part of the everyday visual language of filmmaking now. Uh, they were quite remarkable at the time, of course, and they show the inventiveness that cutting away from a studio setup can give. There's also, at least for the early running, a believable chemistry between the leads and some sharply written, witty exchanges that give the film a solid bank of goodwill to carry it into the rather less believable closing reels. And my only real problem with Joe's and Jim is I am not buying what the narrative is selling at all. The relationship may well be based on a largely autobiographical novel, but there's not much about the relationship post-World War One I find remotely believable. <laughs> In stark contrast to the much better realised pre-World War One friendship between the titular pair, and by the end it's veered into a wild melodrama and I'd kind of given up caring about the film by that point. Now, certainly it's worth watching just to see the evolution of cinematic techniques that we take for granted these days, and that's fascinating in of itself. As a romantic drama, I'm much less convinced of its remaining potency, and for something that is quite often held up as his best film, I was puzzled uh, to find that it's actually seemingly objectively quite bad in places. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly the last half of the film uh, d- doesn't really do a lot for me. Um, uh, the first half, I heartily enjoyed, uh, working quite well. There's, as, as I say, some really good chemistry between the leads, and it just kind of falls apart after that in the end. That little three-way relationship in the end just didn't really work for me. It didn't really seem to make an awful lot of sense, and it didn't seem to fit awfully well with her characters. A bit of an odd fish for me. I can't say I enjoyed it all that much in, in the, the grand scheme of things, but yeah, certainly a lot of potential there but I think it kind of fluffed it at the end. Yes, now this is one where our opinions differ quite substantially I think Scott because I did not get on with this film at all in any way shape or form. Mm -hmm. Now I suppose on a technical level yes it's interesting with the the filming techniques and the editing being feeling much more modern. Yeah. Although I certainly if you watch this now and I personally wouldn't recommend you did but if you watch this now you would possibly find it unremarkable, much like when we talked about Citizen Kane in our first ever Fuds and Film podcast. Technically, Citizen Kane doesn't feel remarkable now, because that's how films are made now. Mm, yeah. Julie Jim has a, a similar issue in that it's influenced so many films since, so that you look at that and think, well, yes, that's how you make films. But um, if you're sort of aware of the cinematic landscape around the time and how that differed, then you can see on a technical level why it's um, worthy of comment. In terms of the story, though, and again, I I want narrative satisfaction, and this film did not provide. Yeah. The problem is, for perhaps the first 10 minutes, I found the repartee between Julie Jim likeable enough, and Oscar Werner is, is quite an enter... Um, actor is enjoyable to watch. Henri Serre, I could take or leave. But after mm-hmm. the first 10 minutes, I just, the characters began to irritate me a little. And even before the introduction of Jean Moreau as Catherine, I was sort of of the opinion of, there's a lot of things happening here that I don't care about, the people I don't care about, and I wanted to end. <laughs> um, to put not to find a point on it. I think because it's so much about the characters that if you don't like the characters, you're not going to get a lot out of this. Mm, yeah. And I, I really, I, the characters were just not working for me. And then certainly after, after the end of the First World War, the authenticity of the setup just doesn't feel believable at all. Yeah. It's really hard to buy what's happening there. And there's bits, I don't know if it's just because of, of the way the film began and their clothing, but it just... It kept making me think of that it was going to be a Buster Keaton film or Charlie Chaplin film at some points. I'm not sure I can explain adequately why that is, but when there are scenes of Jim in bed with Gilbert, the woman he wants to marry but sort of doesn't want to marry, and he's treating her really rather badly, which is another reason I didn't like the characters because they're not very pleasant to other people. Mm. When he's in bed with her and it just, it felt like a set again and it just... I don't know, something about the tone of it never sat well with me. Now, this film, I have reliably informed, can be read on a very deep level. There's a lot of intertext here. There's a lot of mention 
in it of Don Quixote and Sancho Panza and like you could read that the characters in it are actually meant to be them and that you've got to consider for instance nonsense there was not one single windmill in this film <laughs> not buying that theory there is a mention of a windmill though in the term, but it was only a wine but there is a mention I've just recalled no one tilted no at it. but and then like, you can suggest like when you see the characters die and they're in their coffins who's actually died and are the analogues for countries and stuff and you know I am not educated well enough in cinematic theory to know whether that holds water. All I know was, for me, it was more than a bit pish. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's always a problem, but if you try and apply any kind of critical or analytical technique to a film that you don't actually like very much, it doesn't really... Mm-hmm. You, you're automatically not going to give it any credibility at all. So if if, <laughs> if a film's not working on the just the superficial level, I'm certainly not going to be trying to get any deeper insight out of it. And that's uh, that's partly where the Jules and Jim falls down for me. Yeah, now, well, I will allow that simply if I was more skilled or at least more knowledgeable in deconstructing a film like that, that intellectually i could derive more satisfaction from it if i knew really how to read a film like that but yes for, right. certainly for not knowing that at the moment um <laughs> that the first thing is that the film has to be entertaining or thought-provoking or in some way intellectually or emotionally engaging yeah for that to for me to even consider the next step if i don't already know it and for me unfortunately it just wasn't i found that i disliked the characters and not even so much that I hated them or in that way it was more just I just simply didn't care <laughs> about anybody or anything that happened in it and for that reason I would certainly not suggest watching this yeah if you've got three or four years of film education uh, behind you then you'll get a really good essay out of this but then again you could <laughs> probably say the same thing about Blade 2 and Blade 2's got Wesley Snipes killing vampires so I'd go with that yeah so would I um, so there we go our, our best French new wave film so far is Blade 2 <laughs> I was saying, if you are going to look at anything by Truffaut, it would be the 400 blows I would strongly direct you towards. Yes, for, I, I certainly agree from my representative sample of two. Um, but. <laughs> <laughs> now, from Truffaut, we move on to another of the leading lights of the Cahier du Cinéma, Jean-Luc Godard, who, along with Truffaut, is probably the other banner name that people not that familiar with it may well have heard of. Captain of the uh, Starship Enterprise. <laughs> You've got to get it in there, haven't you? You have, apparently. <laughs> and what is his most famous film, possibly the most famous film in the French New Wave, which is A Beau de Souffle, also known in English as Breathless. Yes, uh, but his, uh, Godard's first film, uh, I believe at least his first feature again, commonly held up as the best the film has to offer, which is surprising, given that I'd argue that it's objectively terrible in several areas, but get ahead of myself. I would argue that it's objectively beyond terrible but please carry on <laughs> right, uh, we're introduced to Michel played by Jean-Paul Belmondo who earns himself a promotion from petty thug to public enemy when he murders a policeman seemingly in order to avoid a speeding ticket which yeah that's um, that's a pretty weak start isn't it there's yeah, no right. character motivation there at all it rather brings into question his risk reward calculations doesn't it um <laughs> But well, anyway, um, Michel flees to Paris, hoping to lose himself amongst the crowds and also to reclaim some money that is owed to him to allow him to escape to Italy, I believe it was. While there, he becomes reacquainted with Patricia, played by Jean Selberg, Jean Selberg, Selberg, Jean Selberg. <laughs> I'll cut some of that out. Um, <laughs> She's an American student and would be journalist, and Michelle sets about seducing her, not just for the usual reasons, but also to gain another hiding place in Paris. However, his romantic options are rather limited by the police's ever closing net as their manhunt shuts down Michelle's options. Uh, there's a few problems for me in Breathless, and I suppose we'll deal with the conventional ones first, chiefly that Michelle, despite his insistence that he's modelling himself on Humphrey Bogart, has all the magnetism of Humphrey Bogart's toenail clippings, <laughs> and this unlikable murderous misogynistic tool is not someone I want to see leading a film. The model may perhaps be closer to Jimmy Cagney's gangster roles, but John Paul Belmondo ain't no Jimmy Cagney. Now, if the main influence that's trickled down from Breathless is the freedom to experiment with how films are made, we should at least raise the counterpoint that for a lot of the time, 
those things were done for pretty good reasons. Things like, for example, using a film stock that's actually available in usable quantities such that you're not stuck spacing 18 meter lengths of Ilford HPX photo stock together before shooting. Things like using some studio lights rather than just relying on natural light so that you don't have to push that film stock from ISO 400 up to 800. And this unorthodox choice of film stock severely limited the camera choice, which brings me to my greatest annoyance in the film. The Eclair Camiflex was the only camera able to function with this Franken film stock and and not only did it not synchronise sound recording, it sounds like an elephant skeleton falling down a metal staircase inside an <laughs> echo chamber. So, near as damn it. <laughs> oh, what a wonderful message. So thank you, you've made my day. Uh, so near as damn it, this entire film has been ADR'd, which is still actually a relatively common occurrence in these new wave films, given their punch home for guerrilla permitless outdoor shootings. But here it's done so singularly ineptly... Uh, <laughs> I mean, I try not to get hung up on technical flaws, especially from older films, but this is such a glaring annoyance that I cannot take any of this film seriously. None of the voices sound remotely like they're coming from the same room as the bodies, and what little foley work there that is in there is so badly mixed that it comes across as a parody. Likewise, Breathless may well be the start of the jump cut revolution, but its in, its actual effect is a complete mixed bag. While in, it's used in some driving sequences in ways that are quite commonly used today, which does make it achingly contemporary, it's also rather puzzlingly used to absolutely no effect whatsoever in some dialogue scenes, which... Oh, yes, the scene in the cafe in particular. Yeah, it just makes it... Like, it cuts, it does like a, an edit more or less after every sentence. Yeah. Uh, Driving me crazy. Makes no sense. Doesn't add anything. Makes it look look like a badly produced YouTube vlog. I mean, the film overall is not completely without merit. Uh, Being Mm -hmm. the root of influence for most of these aspects of modern cinematic technique, it does have some legitimacy as a historical document and there's an undeniable energy and vibrancy to it but overall there's so much wrong with it that I couldn't even call it a decent film. Important? I I might grant you that. Classic? Nope. Uh, too much of it is much too rubbish to be mentioned in the same league as your Citizen Kane's or your Lawrence's of Arabia's is, is to be honest uh, I enjoyed it so little I can't even recommend it on a historical level read up on it if you like but as a film rather like most lower league football it's a dismal 90 minutes yes I have nothing but issues with this film <laughs> first of all it's I, I think this is genuinely a bad film yeah. not just a film I didn't like much I think it's objectively a very very bad film it's badly made it's badly written it's badly acted yeah. for me there, there's so very little of merit in this I mean I think maybe the person who comes out of it with the least the least sin on their soul <laughs> for this film is Jean Seberg yeah. and she's given a harder job to do too because she's a, an American acting in this in her what's not her first language mm-hmm <laughs> And her character's um, likable enough, to be fair, but unfortunately... Yeah, she's, yeah. It's, I mean, it's not the strongest character, but it, she's she's likable enough, and even if you question some of her decisions... And I do actually particularly question some of her decisions yeah. in combination of with my other big character issue with the film, and that's one you've mentioned already, Jean-Paul Belmondo as... Michelle. John Paul he's, Bellend, more like. Exactly. I was going to say, he's a complete Bellend. <laughs> he is from the very first scene, deeply unlikable. He has no charisma at all to the yeah. point where even Dennis Quaid could struggle to play this role. <laughs> and <laughs> Your hatred for the Quaid knows no bounds. <laughs> no, I would try to fit it into as many podcasts as I possibly can. <laughs> Preferably, legitimately, like I just have, but it's a challenge to myself. Yeah, um, questionable um, legitimacy, I'd say there, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, John Paul Belmondo, he, he has no charisma at all. His character is so thin. Yeah. The character motivations make no sense. He, he just murders a police officer because. But then there's <laughs> never any suggestion later on that he is psychotic or that he's particularly scared because he's so laid back for the rest of it. Yeah. That, like, it does not fit at all with with the act that begins the film. So yeah, I say no charisma. The character is so thin. He is as almost everything about his character rubs me the wrong way. Hmm. He thinks he's really cool and clever, and he's just a git. Yeah, he's just spectacularly irritating character. So then you add to that the lack of much story, although it's a bit narratively maybe stronger than say Julie Jim in terms of like you kind of see where it's going. There's a thing, one falls on from the other a bit more strongly, but I don't like the characters. The technical aspects were doing my head in. 
Yeah. The, the constant jump cuts that added nothing. Um, for instance, when it's at the start, when it's the... I still think it's pretty inexpertly done, although it's almost a, um, an experiment at that stage coming a couple of years before, say even like Doctor No tried doing a wee bit of jump cuts to a bit more effect, although it used them quite sparingly, that you've got in the, the exploring those, the use of that kind of editing to give it a bit more energy, make it a bit more mm-hmm. frenetic. The car chase at the start, they fit, inexpertly done, but they make sense there. Yeah. But then that scene in particular, the scene in the cafe that I mentioned, where he's talking and what's his I know it's the the guy that Gene Seabers meet him with so he's talking yeah, so those other journalist fellas yeah the other journalists yeah and um, then there's just and I know I don't know whether part of that is simply because of like the technical restrictions because they were using that very short run stock so they can get long takes coupled with the fact that Goddard was feeding lines to the actors just before they started a scene hmm. to try and make everything as fresh as possible which in most cases just comes across as ill prepared <laughs> Um, which is okay when you're doing a silly podcast before anybody makes any smart comments. <laughs> but uh, when you're getting paid to make a film, maybe not so much. So yeah, they literally are, there's an edit after every sentence, sometimes even a half sentence during that scene. And I just, I wanted to throw the film out of the window and somehow ceremoniously set fire to it, <laughs> uh, which is quite difficult to do with a digital file. But uh, <laughs> Then you have problems with the sound, as you said, Scott, and even then the sync's still out in quite a lot of places, even with the ADR. Yeah, it's just, it's really badly done. I mean, the, look, it could, the technique itself has been used for decades. It's nothing inherently wrong with having the film ADR. It's just been done so badly. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like I say, there's, I think there's two instances of making any attempt at having like room noise folded into it, and it sounds absolutely laughable. I did actually laugh out loud. They, they, they dubbed some trade noise, I think, at one point. It's just so ludicrous, <laughs> out, like, out of place. It just doesn't work at all. It's just really sloppily done. Yeah. Unforgivably bad. <laughs> yeah, it's so technically it's a shambles. <laughs> narratively, it's narratively perhaps it's not too bad. It's character wise the other part of it's where it's really let down because yeah, Michelle's character's so thin. This motivations make no sense. Then you have a complete pillock playing him. He's deeply unlikable throughout, and a couple other minor annoyances, but they just. Because I was already so against this film, it just kind of got my back up further. There's a scene at the very beginning of the film and one right at the end where the fourth wall is broken mm. to no good end. Yeah. And it just drives me crazy. It's like, occasionally, a clever use of breaking the fourth wall can sort of put a, an edge into a film or even create humour or something like that. I don't, because it, there's only, I think, the two instances of it and they're so sparing and they add nothing to the film. I genuinely don't understand what they're in there for. Yeah. Um, and I, like, we're not sure at all what Goddard's trying to say or do with that. So for a film that's considered somehow a landmark, it's considered like the standout film of the French New Wave, it's the most famous one, and I genuinely don't understand why or how. Yeah, in many ways I'm glad that it stands out, because then you know to avoid it quite easily. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's really my only explanation for it, but no, I, I could not get on with this at all. It's just badly made nonsense. Unfortunately, this was one that I had bought. This was one of the other ones that I owned for years because of the reputation, and I was interested in sort of again broadening my horizons. So it took me fifteen years after buying it to do it, but never mind that. <laughs> uh, it was it's kind of iconic artwork for it too, and it's like so it's always been sort of on the periphery of my my knowledge of cinema. I've always been vaguely aware of this, and it's so iconic. I'm like, oh, finally, yes, I'm going to make myself watch this. Like, oh, oh, yes. <laughs> oh, oh! Yes, unlike Citizen yes. Kane, it did not live up to its hype in the slightest. <laughs> no, no, quite the opposite. Um, yes, I'm afraid I. Oh, <laughs> not that you can possibly be in any doubt if you're listening to this, but <laughs> if you want to check out the French New Wave, do not begin with Breathless. Do not put Breathless in the middle. Do not end with Breathless. <laughs> Just avoid Breathless entirely. You'll do, be happier. Do not collect two hundred dollars. <laughs> Do not Pasco. Okay. So we move on to a different director once again. This time to Claude Chabrol and his 1970 film Le Boucher or The Butcher. And as you know how this is going to go, <laughs> Scott, <laughs> begin please. Yes, the most recent of the films we'll be covering today, and I think for all these, um, 1970, I'll 
say up front that I like the film well enough, but I've no clear idea why this would be included as a noteworthy film in the New Wave movement, so mm. I'll have to have words with the guys from New Wave Film later on. Uh, follow them on Twitter at, at new underscore wave <laughs> underscore film. Um, I possibly blame them on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they've, they've done yeoman's work there. In rural France, a friendship forms between our titular butcher Popal, played by Jean Yan, and the local school headmistress Helene, played by Stéphane Ojan. Despite his habit of complaining, understandably I suppose, about the things he's seen, he's seen at war at every available opportunity. It seems like romance is forming, but it's put on hold when murders start occurring in the vicinity, and Helene gradually becomes convinced that Popal is the perp. Now, the film seems to spend some time in its middle stretch asking us to wonder who the killer is, uh, although a quick visitation of Ebert's law of conservation of characters will rather put to rest that idea, especially, you know, given the title of the film and that. Yes, I think the fact that the film's called The Butcher and it's about (laughs) a serial killer, um, more or less, um, Mm. it's a little bit of a giveaway. I I think it's... um, it's managing your expectations, I suppose, <laughs> but it, it kind of undermines the tension somewhat. Yeah, <laughs> but at least by the final reels, it's fallen into rather more familiar narrative territory as Helene fears for her life from her devoted, stocky meat vendor. It's aiming to be a suspenseful thriller in the mould of Hitchcock's work, and to be in particular, it seems to owe a great debt to Psycho. Uh, it's got the same just juxtaposition of horrific violence with mundane, low-key everyday life. Unfortunately for what I suspect for most people would be a positive comparison is less so for me as I've never been really that taken by Psycho and have largely similar feelings on The Butcher. It's probably a better or at least more interesting film though compared to Psycho. I'd argue better central performances and the war trauma that Popal suffers is a more compelling reason for going off the rails than Norman Bates' mm-hmm. family problems. And the early repartee between the two leads is quite enjoyable and it creates a believable relationship between two people with different needs from each other. Uh, But all that said, while it's arguably a more intellectual thriller than most, particularly in the early running, there's still a pretty limited degree of credit that can be bestowed upon it for that angle, given that at the end of the day, it's a knife-wielding nutter terrorising a woman. It's not really that far removed from Halloween. As to its inclusion in the starter list of New Wave films, I'm a little puzzled. Perhaps Mm, I'm, I'm now just so familiar with the way the thrillers are made these days, and so unfamiliar with how they were before that I can't notice the advances this made, but this seems like a competent and enjoyable film but it's not something that's anywhere close to the heights of Hitchcock's career. Even say you I mean I am with you too and I have never understood the regard in which Psycho is held. I do not rate Psycho at all but I think cinematically at least Psycho is more interesting than this. Um, I'm talking simply visually um, rather than story wise or anything Mm. and that was 10 years before this. I, I don't see either the particular advances that this was making why this has been held up yeah. As some example of the new wave. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, I, I think it's a good film. Happy enough with it, but an enduring classic? Nah, don't think so. No. Yeah, I think the word you you hit on there is spot on, Scott. It, it's competent. It's well enough made. The character motivations are certainly beat cycle, as you say. The characters are interesting enough, even if the film itself doesn't have anything particularly noteworthy to say about the human condition or anything like that. I mean, it's a... It's only a 90 minute, 90 odd minute film. Yeah. It doesn't outstay its welcome. It's competently made, but to be held up as an example of the new wave or in some way cinema change, I don't see it at all. It is, and this might sound like I'm down at the faint praise, which would be a little unfair because I don't mean to say that it's something you could watch and enjoy, but in almost every respect, it's mundane. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's well enough made, but the the characters are nothing special you've not seen that you've not seen lots of times before the story again reasonably well told but i've seen dozens of films that might have a, a similar sort of story um so sort of similar quality of story it's in no way remarkable it's perhaps a little too colorful actually for the suspense angle to work particularly well for me yeah bit too brightly lit so it's perhaps missing a bit of a trick there but yeah in most respects it's mundane competent reasonably entertaining but just in no way at all remarkable it's nothing not a single thing bad about it it could certainly be a better film but i have no particular issue with any of its technical or writing aspects there's nothing major that they've done wrong it's just it's it's ordinary 
it's very very ordinary if you stumble across it it's perfectly enjoyable little watch but yeah, uh, in terms of it being a, a linchpin of the movement, I, I don't think that's quite right to, to cast it as that. Uh, I've not seen any of Chabrol's other work, so I can't really see where it is, but he, you know, he does a lot of these kind of thrillers. So, but at the same time, all these all the directors that we're talking about are essentially working on each other's stuff more or less constantly throughout it. If you go and look at the, the credits list for any of these films, you'll probably see you know technical advisors and script advisors sort of cross-pollinating between all of them. But uh, Chabrol was a, the technical advisor on uh, Breathless as well. So you know, there's a lot of cross-pollination there. So clearly he's, he's an important supporting character in the role of these films, uh, the role of this movement that these guys have. But in terms of, well, again, on the sample of one, uh, this work is certainly very competent as a filmmaker. It's, uh, I think it might be fair to say it's the most technically competent of the films that we've seen in all these ones. There's nothing that I can really point at to say there's anything wrong with it, apart perhaps from the structure of the, you know, the whodunit aspects is a bit odd. I don't know why that's there, to be honest. It's quite obviously it's a butcher. Um, but it's, it really does give that away. Yeah. Time. Why, why is that title? Because it's not like Butcher hasn't for several hundred years been a um, byword for murder. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, on the, on the technical levels, of course, it's a very, very solidly made film. But yeah, as as far as moving the art forwards from it, yeah, not, not quite so convinced on that one. And I don't know if it's because... I just like for a moment just to go back to Psycho again. You compared it to that and I can see sort of some comparisons there. And the one thing Psycho's got going for it is maybe just the... So the very high contrast black and white that goes on in there mm-hmm. um, Psycho's a more visually arresting film but that's the only thing Psycho's got going for it because I've yeah. never 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 understood the regard in which Psycho is held and this is a considerably more enjoyable film than Psycho although it pales into insignificance in comparison to almost anything else by Hitchcock though Yeah, and so it's, from that point of view it's, it's not even all that interesting just seeing how like French cinema did a take on this because this could with great ease be an American film and half of it looks like it's shot in Southern California yeah <laughs> some of the landscaping I don't know if this is one of the reasons I didn't like it that much but it kept me in mind of and it may be the location because as I say it looked like Southern California it may be the very particular look of the film from that period the film stock but it did feels so often like it looks like a 1970s film there's a lot of Clint Eastwood films from that era too yeah, even like Play yeah. Misty for me that yeah, have that yeah, very exactly particular what was like look there, yeah. the look too and just the the particular colour saturation and things it almost felt like at some point either Columbo or um, <laughs> yeah. Jessica Alba what's her face <laughs> Fletcher. Jessica Fletcher, yes, thank you. <laughs> Jessica Fletcher might turn up just because it had that same feel about it. Um, maybe not so much for the content for those two characters, but it had that feel about it that maybe yeah. you would just have Columbo turn up and ask the butcher just one more question. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going on about it. Perfectly competent film. If you stumble across it, I think you're going to enjoy it well enough. But it's just, it's not a, a standout example of more or less anything. Yeah. Strange one, that. So we'll be move on. That is 1969 film directed by Eric Romer. And his 1969 directorial effort, which he also wrote, called Ma Nuit Chez Maud, or in English, My Night with Maud. Again, Mr. Morris, once more to you, please. Yes, if nothing else, this is going to be a much more straightforward to recap film than many of the others that we've talked about today. John Louis, played by John Louis Trittinga, is working as a mild-mannered engineer out in the provinces, and he's also a Catholic who tries to remain chaste before marriage, although being human, he's had his failures, as I suppose you'd have to say from a religious point of view, although, you know, that's more of a criticism of Catholicism than uh, anything else. I like him, tries to remain chaste, and (laughs) it's more, he says it once or twice, and that's the same thing, right? Yeah, his... uh, Hypocrisy slash self delusion is as well one of the, the main sort of pillars of the film. Um, but anyway, while he sees a girl at mass that he'd like to get to know, uh, the vast bulk of this film concerns a meeting with an estranged old friend, Vidal, played by Antoine Vitesse, who further introduces him to the titular mod, uh, Francois Fabian. Indeed, it's not too much of a reduction to say that the essence of this film is a linguistic three-way between Maud, John louis and Vidal as they discuss various aspects of how John louis Catholicism affects his view on love and relationships, reducing down later to a hot one-on-one session between John louis and Maud as they get down to some seriously intense talking, which <laughs> may just lead to John louis having another one of his uh, relapses. It's a movie of conversations and ideas, so it's not a great choice if you're not in the mood for great slabs of dialogue. 
the good news, I think, is that it's really well written dialogue and it's really well delivered and that makes for a quite enjoyable film. It's nice to see intelligently rendered characters talking intelligently about ideas, which is by no means unique to this film or the French New Wave, but it sure seems like something that's influenced the likes of Linklater or Jarmusch. As a film, My Night at Mods doesn't have the manic dynamism or flourishes that's characterised the other films we've spoken about, but it perhaps reflects a different pillar of the New Wave's ethos, crediting its audience with some degree of intelligence, and as it's treating you with respect, it's rather easier to respect it. I can't find a great deal more to say about it, but it's probably the most rewarding film we've touched on tonight on an intellectual level, at least. Mm -hmm. As as I say, it's it's really just exploring his character. It's part of Romer's um, series looking at morals, and this one's kind of focused quite quite obviously on his Catholicism and how this guy, he's, he's trying to lead the life, although... Clearly, he's quite he's deceiving himself to some to manner on exactly how chaste he is and all his uh, his relationships. But um, yeah, it's it's just adults talking intelligently about adult things, and I found that quite enjoyable. And it's certainly something that's uh, well worth a look at if you can stomach the as I say the the vast slabs of dialogue you will have to get through, which. And I, I, I normally don't have a great deal of sympathy for people who don't want to read subtitles, but when a film is like this, so dependent on the dialogue and so dependent on picking up nuances of what people are saying, it's kind of tough to get the full value of this if you're not a, a French speaker, I would imagine. But nonetheless, uh, despite my French being limited to, to baguette, uh, I found this quite enjoyable and quite easy to follow and uh, the, the ideas seem to get across quite well. So yes, I actually recommend this quite highly. Um Possibly the best we've seen today. Um, maybe not. I think 400 Blows is probably my favourite of this list. But yes, yeah, it's, it's up there. I'd, I'd certainly give this a go. I think intellectually, Scott, you're right. This is probably the most satisfying of these six films. Uh, emotionally, uh, it's probably the 400 Blows that's the most satisfying. Yeah. Fact, I say probably, without doubt. Yeah. It's the most satisfying because so many of the rest are not very good at all. <laughs> Manrishi Mods, intellectually satisfying. For me, very much a film of two halves. The beginning of the film, um, his discussions with Vidal about philosophy and politics and things, and then those discussions continuing at the night with Maud, with Francois Fabian's Maud character. I found them fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, they're very dialogue heavy, but I, I didn't feel that at all. I, I, was, I was thoroughly enjoying them. That was thought-provoking, really interesting, supremely well-written, yeah. and... Very well acted, and unlike I guess, a lot of these other films I've covered, which are much looser in the case of Breathless, almost um, unrehearsed um, and almost improvisational, this is very tightly scripted. Yeah. And perhaps that's why it's so satisfying, actually. Um, again, when you prepare for things, they go better, <laughs> <laughs> as I um, can bear witness to repeatedly. But from the path from the start of the film, when he's talking to his workmates, to his meeting with Vidal, their discussions in the restaurant, all the way up to his night with Maud, those discussions, I, I just find them fascinating, really, in, really interesting. Even if I didn't agree with all of the conclusions they came to, I thought it was thought provoking, intellectually stimulating, really interesting. And then, so the first half of the film, I loved, I genuinely loved the first half of this film. The second half, it kind of turned into a bit of a shitty romance drama and I very much found my interest dropping off after that point. Mm. Um, It never quite returns to the same sort of dialogue after that. There are moments, although more of them are in soliloquy rather than in dialogue actually, and they're fleeting. So after that point, you see Jean-Louis chasing this woman who's taken his fancy in the street um, and you find out later on that she is in fact involved with something that was earlier on in the film but for the most part that second half or at least the the final third is him being a bit creepy actually and it's just him trying to get into bed with someone at first and then fighting a little bit with his catholic upbringing but not fighting all that hard to be honest yeah (laughs) and it's just it's such a disappointment for me after that first half being so exhilarating is not the word as if that's over to it's not how the dialogue is not exciting in that way but the first half being so rewarding that the second half feels almost like a different film like it's just it's a guy chasing after a woman and it feels like such a letdown i still would heartily recommend seeing this 
because the that first part is so satisfying. The dialogue in that first half is just so well written. And yeah, it's stellar. So it's well, well thought out. Stellar. And I mean, to the point, I saw the interview with uh, Trittengan, even the, the dialogue's written where the, the various sort of ums and stumbles are written into it. It's one of these uh, amazingly kind of didactic scripts that he's got going on. We should point out that when we um and ah, it's because we're morons. Uh, but when, <laughs> when they're doing it in this film, it's, it's for uh, actual emphasis and points. And uh, yeah, it is remarkable what it's done. I mean, uh, to be honest, you're absolutely right in what you're saying about the second half. I mean, I only watched this film last night. I've already forgotten most of the second half you were talking about there. And I was kind of, as you were saying, it was going, oh yeah, that actually bit wasn't quite as good by, by a long chalk. You're, you, I agree completely. But yeah, the the first half is, as I say, really something special. I wouldn't suggest you, you watch just the first half then stopped um, because there are no, bits no, no. where it picks back up again in the second yeah. half. But it, it would be worth watching simply for that first half because it is, it's just so satisfying to see something so intellectually engaging in film when it's kind of rare while still being, because you can... You can have a film that can be have that sort of intellectual discussion, but it can be the driest thing you can possibly imagine, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. even drier than Scottish oatcakes, <laughs> uh, which are the driest thing known to man. It's. I still think that in the end, I found the Four Hundred Blows. Oh yeah, yeah, I agree. Ultimately, the more enjoyable film yeah. to watch, but this isn't that far behind it, and it's mm. you know it's the complete opposite of Breathless. You know, <laughs> it's well rehearsed, it's well put together, it's well written. The characters are engaging, believable even if they're, some of the staging feels a little artificial, perhaps a little theatrical, actually. The whole scene in mods feels like it first would have been written and it would have been quite at home on a theatre stage. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't make it a lesser film. It just maybe means it doesn't fit in quite so well with the ethos of the new wave. But it's it's just a really a very, very good film indeed. I would heartily recommend this one. I concur! <laughs> right, so thanks to the wonders of editing, we have travelled forward in time a whole six days, and I have <laughs> with me here Craig Eastman. How to do? Right, and I have enlisted your help because mm-hmm. uh, Drew had not seen Pirro the Madman uh, primarily, mm-hmm. and I did a singularly terrible job of explaining anything about it by myself, so I was hoping you could help out with well, that. Well, I think that but- might make two of us, but... <laughs> but before that, of course, <laughs> there's the, the simple matter of all these films, what you've Scene. So perhaps we might. Well, I'll just throw some names at you, and uh, you can Ooh. give us your thoughts on them, and then you can perhaps guess if we agreed with you. Or okay, okay. Let me let me first of all apologise to the listeners for not making the main recording, but look at the lengths I've gone to to be with you now. So, <laughs> um, yes, no fire away. The first film that we covered was uh, Rufon's Four Hundred Blows. What's your thoughts on that one? Loved it. I, um, as you know, I was kind of dreading this. Exploration yes. of New Wave for no other reason than I am heavily prejudiced against this for no particular reason. I think I've got, um, <laughs> I've got, I've had, I've, I've spent my cinematic life having this very um, silly preconceived notion of what the French New Wave is about. And as far as I can think back, I think it's been entirely informed by a skit someone sent into Channel 4's, uh, Channel 4 in the UK, um, their show Takeover TV, mm. um, in which they did their own version of Abu de Soufflé. And that seems to have informed my entire opinion <laughs> on French New Wave cinema without me actually having bothered to watch any French New Wave cinema. So... <laughs> I went into I went into 400 blows really not expecting much and was really really pleasantly surprised almost too pleasantly surprised actually because I then assumed that the rest of the films I was going to watch were going to be just as enjoyable yeah. um more on that later but um <laughs> 400 blows was a genuine surprise to me it was a far more subtle emotionally led piece than I expected it to be and I guess I mean it was at the spearhead of the the movement right a lot of people consider mm-hmm. it to be the first major work of the um new Nouvelle Vague. So yeah, I went into it with a heavily preconceived notion and was pleasantly surprised when the rug was pulled out from under my feet. And what we got was this very, very subtle downplayed emotional piece, which was far more intelligent in the way it went about raising questions than I'd expected it to be and was far less predicated on choppy uh, editing techniques and um, the sort of cinema verite style that I was expecting to uh, to encounter mm. and that I thought was going to en- encumber it. I had assumed was going to encumber it. Um, the central performance by your young lad whose name escapes me now, and uh, sorry, Jean-Pierre uh, Leo who plays Antoine Donnell, was wonderfully low-key. And this is this is one of those films that, as a parent now myself, I think I'm probably watching uh, very differently than I might have done a few years ago. And very 
quietly heartbreaking in a sense, actually, this story of this young guy who, this young lad who just seems to be misunderstood at about every turn and turns to a life of petty crime, not because he has any bad intentions, but almost just out of frustration and, and boredom at the lack of social life he has. The, uh, sorry, and the lack of relationship with his parents. Mm. I think one of the most heartbreaking things about it is there's a scene partway through the movie after uh, Antoine has spotted his mother um, canoodling with a, another man in the street and she sees him. Um, and obviously she realises that he knows that she's having an affair now. And she starts to go out of her way to sort of placate him at home, whereas before she's been quite combative and dismissive of him. She suddenly becomes this wonderful mother because she's obviously terrified that he's going to spill the beans to his uh, his stepfather. Yes. And there's this scene which should be one of the happiest um, scenes, but actually the the tragedy surrounding it um, really renders it quite sour in that this attempt that his mother makes um, to uh, to keep him sweet, she and the stepfather and the, the son, uh, Antoine, go to the cinema and they actually engage with him for once. And it's obviously under slightly false pretenses on the mother's part, but they have a wonderful night out and this is the happiest yeah. you've seen this child the whole <laughs> film. And it makes it all the more heartbreaking that it's... Um, a, it's a falsehood, and B, that we we obviously know the the general situation the, the kid's in. And by the end of the film, at the point at which he has been sent to, I guess, I'm not sure what the nearest equivalent we have for it here is, but I suppose sort of, a, I don't know, some sort of reformation centre for, for problem children. Yes. Um, um, and obviously he, well, are we any spoilers for a film which is 57 years old? <laughs> Um, I think we're allowed to, yeah. So yeah, that's your standard of the stuff, yeah. He, he makes a one flew over the cuckoo's nest style bid for freedom um, uh, with the sole aim of actually just apparently reaching the sea because he's never seen the sea. And it was quite devastating when he got there that the film's choice for a climax was to have this kid turn the camera and break the fourth wall, which is something I thought was going to happen constantly throughout this film because that's just one of those new wave things. That they're just going to be breaking the fourth wall constantly. <laughs> and it is used to far less effect than some of the other films we'll talk about. But here, um, the final shot of the kid turning to camera and staring at the audience made me feel equal parts guilty, equal parts ashamed, equal parts sad. Um, <laughs> it was really, um, really poignant and touching and... I think you have to. I mean, obviously, we've we've uh, we've seen far more emotionally upsetting scenes than that in the the period since this film was made. But I think you have to take it in the context of the time that, uh, sorry, in the context that at the time this film was made, French cinema was not about social realism. Um, I have no experience of it, but having researched it, obviously the. The uh, the big thing about French New Wave is that it was breaking boldly from tradition of French cinema, and that was very straight, um, very straight laced productions. Uh, many of them sort of historical dramas, um, costume dramas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think this must have been one of these first films to come along, which had at its heart sort of social realism and a very naturalistic style. Mm-hmm. Um, and really pointed the finger at this French society. And I can imagine at the time made people feel very, very uncomfortable watching it in the cinema. Uh, I think your reaction to that final shot and what people at the time must have thought of it coming out the cinema probably probably could have told you a lot about them as parents, I would imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, I can imagine the crowd coming out and being divided into equal parts sympathetic and, uh, you know, on the other side, like, well, wasn't he a meddlesome young boy? What was the point of that? It was, yeah, it was quite subtly heartrending, and I was pleasantly, pleasantly surprised by it. As an introduction to the Nouvelle Vague, I was almost overwhelmed by it. I shall certainly uh, look to add it to my collection, and I will revisit it again. And uh, as I stated before, I also made the mistake of allowing it to inform my expectation of what the remaining <laughs> films would be like. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, what was what was your consensus? Uh, did you and Drew reach an agreement on 400 blows? Or? Well, what's your guess? I think you both liked it. That is correct, yes. Um, because we're not animals. Uh, yes, um, easily the most charming film we've talked about. Uh, it's the most believable. Mm-hmm. I won't say much about it because you'll have just heard me talking about it if you're listening to this. But yeah, we certainly both loved this film. And uh, like you say, it did. They'd also give us a, a very false expectation of what might follow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that's not just me. Then we should yes, make sir. it. We should make the the uh, the listeners aware of the fact that I've done my best not to. En- after not making the initial recording, I have done my best not to engage either yourself or Drew as to yeah. your opinions <laughs> on these films. I kind of want to. I kind of want to find out as the listeners are finding out almost. <laughs> okay, and the other Truffaut film we covered was Joe's and Jim. 
Yes, uh, Jules et Jim, which unfortunately I found to be largely insufferable. Far more navel gazing, and the the biggest problem I had with Jules and Jim again. I feel like this is like the four hundred blows. I feel like this was trying to um, this was trying to stoke the um, the fires of sort of French social conformity, and and um, I mean it seems like a, it seems fairly it seems fairly low key now, but I suppose at the time I can imagine the suggestion of this. Um, sort of love triangle and almost an open relationship between these three adults would um it could, could possibly have outraged a lot of people i mean i don't i don't know i don't know what french society's um understanding of that sort of thing at the time was whether or not they've always been that liberal or whether this would have come as a shock to the audience it's potentially mm-hmm. an interesting tale but i just found myself so detached from the characters that it was really really hard to care and it would be disingenuous of me to try and pass my opinion off as being particularly informed because I'll be honest and say that for about 25 minutes in the middle of this film, I fell asleep on the sofa. (laughs) Uh, But when I woke up, I had no really clearer idea of where this was going. And I certainly didn't care any less about the characters. I get the impression that that 25 minutes could have been excised from the film and not have ruined my enjoyment of it. And well, sorry, my enjoyment wouldn't have been more enhanced. Um, Sorry, if uh, the, uh, those 25 minutes hadn't gone missing uh, beneath my eyelids. So, yeah, p- potentially an interesting film. And I mean, the performances for what they were, I was happy enough with the performances, but I don't know. I can appreciate again that some of the technique involved in this film was probably revolutionary at the time. And this is probably something that I think you could apply to a lot of these films is that I think there's probably more, let me think how I want to phrase this. Looking at it from the perspective of 2016, I think there's probably more value in these films from a technical merit in terms of the way the films are edited uh, and the production value and the techniques involved um, and how that has gone on to inform modern cinema rather than just enjoying them as narratives. Mm, Yes, which actually is almost the exact conclusion we came to in this one, certainly I did. Mm. It's, It's worth watching to see the evolution of the cinematic technique. But the narrative I was not buying in the slightest. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so oh, I think I'm, Drew had much the same opinion. But yeah, I'm that, slightly that, relieved because I had a horrible feeling I was going to spout that and then you were going to say, well, actually, we quite liked it. No. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> well, in fact, I think the I, I quite enjoyed the whole first 30 minutes, I guess. The, the kind of pre-World War One relationship was... Yeah, it didn't uh, get but, off to a terrible start. And then there was yeah. the, in, the, the interesting premise of them both going then to war on opposite sides seemed to set up what could have been a really emotionally racking second half of the movie but actually but it skips over it in two minutes <laughs> skips over it in two minutes yeah. and when they come back in contact there's like no discussion about the war it's like well I'm glad we didn't end up killing each other on the battlefield yes now about that stuff we were doing before <laughs> yes. there's there's almost no point to it whatsoever from a narrative point of view it doesn't actually inform anything that happens thereafter as far as I'm aware of so it seemed <laughs> like a really you know I, I had assumed that the period in which the film was set um, was going to play a sort of uh, a pivotal role in uh, plot developments. But actually, like you say, it's just almost entirely skipped over and not really referred to again all that much that I can remember. Unless, as I say, um, a, a particularly big deal was made of it during the 25 minutes that I dozed <laughs> off. But I'm guessing from what you're saying, it wasn't. No. In, in many ways, I'm quite jealous of your ability to doze through the middle of this. Uh, <laughs> probably would have improved the film for me. <laughs> <laughs> not that I've got a history of dozing off during films, right? <laughs> So I think other one that we talked about, John Luke Goddard film, the first one, Breathless, very much the poster child for the oh, yes. wave, I would say. Yeah. Uh, your take on that one? Almost entirely met my expectations, actually. And this was, <laughs> I think this was the second film I watched because off the back of 400 Blows, I thought, well, if I'm that wrong about this, then the first thing I need to do is actually mm. check out Abu de Soufflé and find out how wrong I was about that because that's been the big... As you say, it's the poster child and it's the film I've always had. Other people's notions of it have always been the image I've had in my head uh, when I think about French New Wave. So I delved in, expecting to be um, pleasantly surprised and instead was not. The the great problem with uh, Breathless for me, lies in its central character. So Jean-Paul Belmondo plays this character whose name I have completely forgotten and I'm not really that bothered to try and remember. Michel. Michel, that's it. Who is, after all, uh, an arsehole. 
And yes. <laughs> the reason we know that is because the film the film bothers to open uh, with his character <laughs> giving a speech, which literally the first line of the film is him saying, after all, I'm an arsehole. <laughs> and for the next hour and 45 minutes or so, he does absolutely nothing to disprove that notion or try and attempt to persuade the audience otherwise. It is an hour and a half of a man pestering a woman to sleep with him incessantly. When she doesn't, he calls her a louse. He gets annoyed about it. There are some sort of asides to American pop culture. There's some jumpy editing. Uh, A lot of people smoking Galois uh, or Galois. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. I've always said Galois, but that's only because I think it sounds cooler that way. And in the end, he gets shot by some police and dies whilst calling the woman a louse again, which seems to be his way of trying to be cool while he dies. And all I could think at the end of it was, well, I'm glad he's dead. (laughs) Um, Again, from a technical standpoint, I'm sure that the way this movie informed, um, in particular, probably editing techniques um, and the trend for the way that movies were edited. And it's interesting to think that these films were themselves inspired by certain American movies and that this must have created some sort of feedback loop whereby Hollywood had inspired the French New Wave and they in turn ended up inspiring another generation of Hollywood uh, filmmakers. I'm sure there's an interesting story to be had there and I'd be infinitely more interested in delving more into that than I would in watching uh, Breathless again. So, uh, interestingly, there is, um, there's a remake of, there's an American remake of Breathless from within the last sort of 15 years or so, isn't there, with, um, who's your fellow who just acts by blinking the whole time? Had a terrible Irish accent in Jackal, the Jackal. And his dog died in Hachi. Richard Gear. Richard Gear. that's it. I didn't want to go down the gerbil route. Um, <laughs> there's a remake of Breath of Richard Gear, which I had no intention of ever coming within a million miles of, but I'm almost tempted to see it now because I'm told it's actually <laughs> quite good. But then a lot of people said the same thing about the original Breathless. I'm sure that the value in Breathless from my perspective would be actually in researching further and drawing comparison by uh, with American films that followed where the mm-hmm. director's probably claimed and editors claimed to be influenced by the new wave i think that's where the value in this lies i can understand that it was probably a very in terms of the language of cinema it's a very informative movie but in no way shape or form can i get behind the notion that this is to be taken as just an enjoyable film in a contemporary sense just from a narrative perspective or plot development it is literally about a guy who is a total who revels in being a total who tells everyone he's a total kills a police officer in cold blood and doesn't seem to care one way or another about it and then is in turn killed by the police about an hour and a half later and good riddance to him. Uh, Mm. (laughs) Those are my thoughts on Breathless. I'm bizarrely, or sorry, I find it bizarre that it's it's still held contemporarily in the reverence that it is from a, just from a storytelling perspective. Yeah. Yeah, really odd, really odd. It's one of those films that I don't know how you felt about it. I'm going to guess that you and Drew felt the same, actually, because I'd be like blown away if you told me you'd enjoyed it. But it's yeah. one of those films that makes me think, really, am I taking crazy pills? Yes, um, we also both consider it to be pure pish. Uh, <laughs> hey, and, I'm three for three. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> yeah as, as we've mentioned, that central character is just so obnoxious and it's technically inept. In most mm-hmm. respects, I mean, I can respect it as a historical document, but yeah, there's there's so much uh, jump cutting for no reason, like in the middle of dialogue and all these kind of things. I, I yeah. understand this is maybe where it all came from. And there's other mm-hmm. elements of it that are can appreciate the energy and vibrancy it had, but it's just yeah. actually rubbish in this film. I, I'm happy enough just to go and watch those things done properly later on rather than this, uh, which is yeah. really just a bad film on every level. Someone uh, someone who shall remain nameless uh, said to me years ago when I'd first spoken to someone about this film, oh, I've never seen a Bout de Souffle. Oh, it's fantastic. You can, it's a, mo- it's a movie, and I, I'm trying to remember the exact words, along the lines of, it's a movie that moves to a beat. F*** off. <laughs> <laughs> what a totally disingenuous statement. And I've resolved to uh, to get back in touch with that person purely so that I can uh, <laughs> I can find where they're living and cessate them as is required of my conscience. <laughs> it's a movie that moves to a beat. No, no, it's not. Yeah, um, interesting only from a perspective that I viewed it as a complete car crash almost, and I'm, I'm baffled by the by the cultural fanfare surrounding it in this this day and age. But there you go. Um, I'm always open to the notion that I may be wrong. 
I I don't believe we are. <laughs> <laughs> so we moved on from Breathless to the second film from Godard, the uh, some years later with the Perot the Madman or Perot Le Fou with mm-hmm. the same uh, same lead character Jean Paul Mimondo yes I mean Ferdinand Griffin mm-hmm. now what did you make of this now I've not we've uh, this will be the first we've heard of this uh, obviously wasn't particularly looking forward to it given the crushing mm-hmm. disappointment of Breathless mm-hmm. uh, what did you make of this one can you well first off I mean I struggled deeply trying to describe even in the loosest terms what the plot of this is about so do you have uh, any better of a, I'm, I'm a not going to cast any more light on that um, <laughs> why what I will say about um, Piero Le Fou is that I selected it on the basis that I was so disappointed by Breathless that I thought Jean Paul Belmondo can't be that bad, right? Yeah. Um, and Jean Luc Godard, I'm oh, come on, come on, <laughs> mate, come on. I'm, I thought I'm going to give them both a second chance, and I knew I had a limited window to watch these films. I wasn't going to be able to watch all of the ones that you um, or we had agreed that we wanted to talk about. So I selected this as the fourth film. Uh, on that basis. And I was pleasantly surprised by certain aspects of it, yeah. which is not to say that I enjoyed it intensely. Um, but it's- she'll give you the, she'll give the, a kind of, this is the, the, the small summary that I managed for it. Was this. Right. Okay. Uh, for about 10 minutes, it seems like it's about John Billman Wando's character going through a midlife crisis in his marriage. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then about 10 minutes after that, it's gone so far from that initial premise that it's a completely different film entirely. Um, mm-hmm. With him uh, bumbling across France with Marianne Renoir, uh, played by mm-hmm. Anna Karina, who was a babysitter, but turns out to be an ex-boyfriend and also running guns for Algerian rebels. Yep. <laughs> and before <laughs> long, they've murdered Marianne's boyfriend, they've been hunted by cops and rebels running across France. And was, Right, was that her boyfriend <laughs> lying on the floor of her apartment? That's what I took it to be, yes, but right. I'm not entirely I, convinced. I'm not that. sure I knew they were Algerian. <laughs> did you have this weird, did you have this thing that I had where I thought to myself, wait a minute, have I just lost like five minutes or something? I was watching this film. It's a bit non-linear, yes. I was, yeah, I was watching this film and then all of a sudden I was aware of the fact that we're in an apartment. It appears to be Marianne's apartment. Piero is there. Sorry, what's his proper name again? I forget. Ferdinand. Yeah. Uh, Ferdinand is there with Marianne. There are an assortment of guns stacked up against the yes. walls that Ferdinand doesn't seem that perturbed by. Yes. And there's a dead man <laughs> face down on the carpet that no one seems to be acknowledging. <laughs> yes. um, and yes, I kind of wondered, I thought, whoa, wait a minute. Did I just have some sort of weird... Yes, that was um, the point. I thought it was having some kind of hemorrhage somewhere along the line. Right, yeah. so you had the same experience then. I honestly thought to myself, oh, have I just undergone a bout of amnesia? Is this what amnesia is? <laughs> there is... Something to enjoy about uh, Piero Le Fou, uh, Piero the Madman, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it until about half an hour before I came to log in here, and th- there was something very familiar about it. And do you know what it is? It reminds me a lot, and given the given the reverence with which he is um, held in France, it wouldn't surprise me to find out that this is one of the films that has informed him as a director. It reminded me a lot of some of Takeshi Kitano's work. In the way that it blends sort of, and specifically I'm thinking there's a lot of sonatine in there. In the way that it blends yeah. this irreverence, this the road trip aspect, there's the whole, obviously a lot of it is set around the beach. And all this sort of apparently completely unrelated stuff, day-to-day stuff and just borderline insanity that happens in between bouts of people being chased by um, killers. But well, I was you brought that up because it didn't it didn't occur to me until you said it there. But now it's crystallised quite nicely there. So that does make a lot of sense to me. Does now. that? Are you yeah. getting that vibe? Like I say, it didn't occur to me at first. I just had this weird feeling of deja vu about it. And then about literally about half an hour before I logged on to speak to you, Scott, I thought sonatine, and it's got that kind of balance between irreverence, black humour, and violence. Um, yeah, because it and, is a film that just swings around between like disconnected imagery and speeches to the camera and these weird yeah. set piece chases from nowhere and voice, arbitrary voiceovers and it, it's Properly all over mental. the shop and tone. Properly yeah. mental, but I yeah. kind of I almost enjoyed it. Like a key to this was the fact that Jean Paul Belmondo's character Ferdinand is at least more sympathetic in this. He's almost likable. Yeah. Not that he's necessarily um, some sort of social paragon, because I mean he's a guy who's run away from a wife from his wife at yeah. a party, which if I if the subtitles were correct, as a party that his wife's husband had put on it, which she was hoping to introduce him to someone else who might have been able to get him a job or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> and he makes the decision to leave her and hooks up with this woman who went out five years ago, yes. And then it turns out she's, as you say, a, a gun runner for Algerian madmen, basically. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, 
he's he's a relatively sympathetic character in that. He's certainly not as as downright objectionable as he was in uh, in Breathless. And his performance w- is certainly streets ahead of what it was. Hell in Breathless. yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Much Which kind of makes me wonder. Yeah, exactly. But I also feel like there's a certain acting technique missing in Breathless, and it makes me wonder if that was actually a stylistic choice because there is such a flip between his performance in Breathless and the performance he's given here that I can't imagine that's just a set of acting skills that he's, um, <laughs> you know, he's absorbed yeah. exactly in in the sort of intervening five years or whatever it was. So that cast in interesting light on breathless or as as interesting a light as could be but there was i also felt like the the sort of the breaks the camera sort of the stuff to the fourth wall i felt was kind of done in it was almost done in humor this time i felt it was it was um it had a self-aware vibe about it a vibe about it rather as though the filmmakers at this point were like yeah cool okay we know that people are on board with the french new wave thing and we're going to reference the fact that we know this is um a french new wave movie and the bit that sort of tipped that opinion was um where ferdinand and marianne are in the car and he says something he says something and she says wait who are you talking to and he turns around and looks at the back of the car and says the audience yeah and it was kind of done in like this really subtle kind of playful way and i thought all right okay i'm gonna give you i'm gonna give you the benefit of the doubt i didn't enjoy it enormously but Again, to go back to the the Takeshi Kitano sort of thing, uh, there's this. There are some really bizarre scenes in this that I'm not entirely sure that. Again, I hadn't. I'm pretty certain I didn't fall asleep during this, <laughs> but I can't back that up with any kind of cogent plot summary that would yeah, fill so. in the gaps that I think are there. But there's this amazing scene at the end that made me that, and I think this is the thing that made me think. Wait, to te- Takeshi Kitano, where there's the most Heath Robinson ploy to ambush. These Algerian, I'm assuming you're right that they're Algerian, these hitmen who are coming after him in a car by driving through the woods and having a man running around a tree with a rope <laughs> dropping a net on their car <laughs> as they drive past. And then, I don't know, distracting them while the, while Marianne shoots them from a distance with a rifle. <laughs> I don't... I can't, like, what is happening here? What sort of time slip have I fallen into? Totally bizarre. But um, And then, I mean, the ultimate finale... Um, you know, Piro's, uh, Ferdinand's um, conclusion, the conclusion to his story arc, as we might put it, suitably bizarre and, a, and in a really blackly humorous way that, again, very Catano-esque. And I would also shout out, give a, I would also call out to, I think, my favourite scene in the movie, which was the uh, the small French fella who was in Marianne's flat, who have no idea what his purpose was, but he seemed to be running about looking at guns and stuff. And then just at some point, is dead on the floor with a pair of scissors stuck in his neck and he's still half alive. And Piro comes and wiggles the scissors about, <laughs> much to the much to the annoyance of the man who's still partially alive, and says, um, what is it he says? A wonderful death for a small man. Or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> a wonderful death for a small man. Great. Brilliant. <laughs> and then pulls the scissors out of his neck. I have no idea what was going on. I'm aware of the fact that she was a gun runner or something and was being pursued by these people. Other than that, I cannot tell you a damn thing other than in terms of the performances and the sort of this wonderfully lackadaisical meandering um, narrative that somehow managed to almost endear itself to me um, through its sort of blackly comic moments and just irreverent kind of humour uh, is markedly, markedly a better film in terms of, well, from a from a modern perspective of sitting down and just wanting to enjoy a film as a story, uh, markedly better than Breathless. But I yeah, still wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Yeah, it certainly won me over, I think, by the end of it. It was, like you say, it's, it's very difficult to come up with any kind of recap that makes sense. It's it's like a mm. slightly surreal relationship drama that gets alternately interrupted by mm-hmm. gun running and chase sequences, and it's... It's mm-hmm. a very strange film. I mean, certainly you can't use the word believable anywhere near it, but at least I felt that interplay between Belmondo and Karina's convincing, at least. And that made it a bit easier to get behind the, the narrative when it goes off in its wild, surreal flights of fancy. And yeah, it, yeah. It, it, somehow it worked, but on paper, it really shouldn't. And it's the sort of thing that if, as a lot of these things uh, were done by improvisation. You could kind of believe that, but it just goes all over the place. But somehow this one works mm-hmm. in a way that a lot of the other ones we've spoken about simply didn't. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's, it's tough, to, tough to actually recommend it, but certainly it's miles for, ahead of Breathless for me. If I was going to try and sell it to someone, I would say to them, and again, not to labour a point on the Kitano thing, but I would say, 
I would say to someone, look, do you wish that Catano had made a film that was exactly midway between the stupid irreverent humour of getting any and the bizarre gangsters by the beach fooling around ultraviolence? Well, it's not really an ultraviolent film, but violence of Sonatine. And if the answer is yes, check this out. It might, it might fill, it might fill in a blank for you in your cinematic lexicon, but I couldn't, um, I can't help but feel that I enjoyed this purely on the basis of, to any degree rather, on the basis of the fact that I found some of the films around it so disheartening. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to say to someone, don't watch it, but I'm not going to go out of my way to recommend it. Yeah, but certainly an interesting piece, I'll put it that way. I, I was thinking about this earlier, and I think if I do come back to revisit this film, I think I'll do it on a beautiful summer's day. I'll have the patio doors open, letting the fresh air in. I'll have a couple of beers, and I'll sit with my feet up with the rays of sunshine coming in and watch this on the uh, the TV to recreate at least some of that Mediterranean vibe. And uh, yeah, get myself half cut enough that I don't know, you know, narrative wise, it might make some sense to a, a an alcohol adult mind. <laughs> an interesting piece, and certainly the better of the two Belmondo performances uh, by a long chalk. Yes, by Miles. Yes, yes, absolutely. Oh well, I'm surprised, actually, pleasantly surprised to find that we seem to be largely uh, singing from the same song sheet there. Then, yes, you could not fit a fag paper between our views on most of these things. Um, cool. Yes, uh, you can find out our opinion on the butcher and many mods, I suppose, when you listen to the edited podcast. But, uh, Which I look forward to. Listen, until then, I'll, I'll hand us back over in time to Drew from six <laughs> days ago. Diddly do, diddly do, diddly do, diddly do. So that is it for this podcast. We will return um, later on in the month for our. A discussion on the work of the left bank artists in the, um, La Nouvelle Vague. If you want to contact us, you can do by email at podcast at fudsandfilm.com, uh, through Facebook, facebook.com slash fudsandfilm, through Twitter at fudsonfilm. And to that end, we have had a um, contact with regard to this from our regular viewer, Bunty Hoven. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Matt Toller. Uh, Regular listener, Matt Hall said he always thought that the French New Wave seemed daunting and inaccessible. Um, of the films that the Criterion Collection offers, The 400 Blows is the only one I've even considered seeing. Well, Matt, I would strongly suggest that you do give that one a go. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's a rewarding film. It's If you want to get into the French New Wave, from what I've seen so far, I would say that's the one to begin with. Very possibly to end with, actually. Yeah. You know, uh, uh- I would say, I would say this. I mean, daunting. I certainly agree with, and mm-hmm. because it, it, you know, it, as with all these genres, you've no experience of where do you start chipping away at it. Um, so yeah, yeah, absolutely get that. Although the sort of inaccessible part of it, I would have agreed until I actually started watching some of them. When you actually start to see and even even the ones I've not appreciated, the ones that I didn't like they still feel very much like modern films. There's, mm-hmm. yeah. if, if you've seen any film lately, then you're not going to be bamboozled by what they're trying to do here. Uh, so in that aspect, it's probably less uh, daunting, at least. Uh, there is a familiarity in watching a lot of these films because so much of the influence, so much of the techniques that they've kind of pioneered or popularised has found its way into the language of modern cinema that you won't feel that any of them are completely inaccessible to you, I don't think. You might just think they're ineptly done, <laughs> as we have done with a few of them, but yeah. Um, it's If you're interested in taking it further, you're absolutely right. 400 blows from the limited exposure I've had so far uh, is the place to start, and well, maybe we'll have some more for you in their next uh, podcast by the 20th. So as I say, given you how to contact us, we look forward to hearing from you. Bring up points for discussion, points of conflict, um, arrangements to fight to the death, to see who's right about film, I don't know. Whatever you want, get in yeah. contact with us, let us know your thoughts. And until then, we look forward to hearing from you and we will be back with you the 20th because apparently what I'm going to just do now is repeat everything Scott said. <laughs> there we go. I have been true and I bid you adieu. And I've been Scott and I do too. Bye bye.